soon to be Dr. James Hewitt. Thanks very much for joining us. You're welcome, Greg. I'm really looking forward to when this process is over and I don't have to talk about my PhD at the beginning of every every podcast interview I do. But, when you um, said this but... process is over, I thought you might be referring to our conversation. I get that a lot, so I'm not offended. No, no. Looking forward to our chat today, Greg. And uh, <laughs> But yeah, the PhD has been hanging around for too long now. It's uh, It's nearly done, thankfully. I know that feeling. But before we get to the specifics of that, I actually want to start by asking you about who you really are, because based in part on your recent podcast with Greg Bennett, in which it emerged that you were privy to a doping scandal, I've started to question your identity. So are you actually Grigory Rodchenkov in disguise? <laughs> yeah, from the affair companies. Um, it's yeah. Um, uh, no, I'm not a doping mastermind. Um, uh, but um, I had a, a kind of ringside seat to what was going on, put it that way. Um, I mean, my uh, journey into this, as you know, uh, as some of your listeners may know, was during through my time as a racing cyclist, I was a full time racing cyclist, trying to be a professional cyclist for, for several years. And that involved me moving to France full time at the age of uh, about 19. Um, uh, in the early 2000s and, and uh, initially with this regional team uh, to try to pursue this dream of becoming a full-time pro. Um, and uh, I worked my way up through the teams and, you know, I ended up being okay and ended up riding for this, this professional development team that was linked with one of the top pro teams. So it was a, an elite under 23 team. It meant that we got to ride a lot of pro races, these UCI ranked races and uh, and start to experience that life so i i, I rode i raced full time got a little bit of money to support me along the way um but in the early 2000s you know there was this uh, there'd been this huge doping scandals and um uh, and one emerged one kind of blew up which became known as the affair cofidis um which was centered around the cofidis pro cycling team and unfortunately we had a teammate who was also my housemate who got embroiled in this he basically had a trainer um you know a coach um who uh, had been heavily involved and turned out that the um french uh drug police the stoops the police contre le stupéfiant um had been um <laughs> spying on us essentially they'd been monitoring our phone calls from our houses they'd been watching us and you know and until then i thought it was pretty cool that you know the coffee team car sometimes used to park outside our house and you know, this guy came around for, for meals, his trainer, and, you know, uh, and didn't really question what was going on in my teammate's bedroom. Um, but it turns out, you know, there's quite a lot you can do with a, with a little fridge uh, in your bedroom that no one knows about. And uh, um, anyway, you know, uh, this all came to roost. It all came crashing down when, um, you know, there was a knock on the door one day and that house got raided and um, we got arrested and turned out that my teammate had been embroiled in this, um, this doping scandal which some of the very well-known riders got caught up in as well. And, um, you know, it was a scary experience. It was, it was frightening. Um, you know, uh, these were guys who were not to be messed with and they were old school, you know, did the whole good cop, bad cop routine on me, um, uh, of, you know, trying to get out the information to find out if I was involved and, you know, I was completely naive, um, really at that time, but soon I wasn't naive. You know, I realized that the depth of corruption essentially, um, in, in the sport and, um, but it didn't put me off the sport. It just made me resolute that I wasn't going to go down that track. Um, uh, particularly given that doping was a criminal offense in France, but also, you know, for, for ethical, for moral reasons. And that led me into this world of trying to find legitimate ways to explore human potential and maximize my performance, which led to this fascination with science and technology. And then into eventually the work that I do today and you know, happy to kind of share how that ended up translating into workplace well-being and performance, which is which is my focus. But um, but yeah, but that time thinking about endurance sport, human optimization, doing that in ways that are, that are healthy. You know, that's also something which which came out of that, because um, you know, the, what I witnessed of uh, uh, of illegitimate performance enhancement is that there are costs. And there were some people I was very close to who raced for some teams in Italy where, you know, doping was you know, at a kind of catastrophic level for many years. You know, I think that's public knowledge. That's not, that, that's not just speculation. And uh, one rider in particular, who was similar age to me and had raced for some very good 
teams there um, and, uh, and had been given such an array of pharmaceuticals, um, supposedly under supervision, but not really. Um, he ended up with a medical condition off the back of that. Um, it basically screwed up his thyroid um, uh, because of, uh, you know, they were giving him a combination of you know, thyroxin to try and ramp up his metabolism, help him lose weight, cortisone, um, you know, for performance enhancement acutely in races, but also uh, for body composition. Um, you know, they, were, they were giving these kids essentially sleeping pills to uh, um, help them to recover, supposedly, after competition and training. Um, and so, yeah, that set my track to try and explore human optimization, but do it in a way that isn't going to compromise our health in the process. And that's the, very much the approach that I take into thinking about workplace wellbeing today. And my fascination with these very demanding environments where people are pushed to the limit often and exploring whether you can still achieve your potential, um, but do that in a way that doesn't destroy you in the process. So, um, yeah, so hopefully that gives you a bit of a bit of an insight into uh, why I approach um, workplace well-being and performance the way that I do. Now. Doping is so interesting and I don't want to get too sidetracked, but I suppose that your other mistaken identity could be for the man who some people surmise is in fact Prince Harry's biological father, <laughs> oh, just gosh. given your name. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's that's pretty niche, isn't it, for maybe some of our international audience. But, you know, there's this very famous guy called uh, James Hewitt, who everyone suspected was having an affair with uh, you know, the late Princess Diana. And, you know, there's this speculation that he might be you know, Prince Harry's father, um, which is, you know, has obviously never been proven. But you know, that name, unfortunately, there's zero chance of me kind of hitting the top of Google search results based on my name alone. Um, and, um, you know, the, the James Hewitt.com is for sale for about 45 grand from for some squatter because, you know, uh, uh, it's obviously well known. I mean, it's come up quite a few times. I think the worst was I, I broke my arm pretty badly in a, a sporting accident and um, I was you know, ambulance to hospital. And I remember I got to hospital and I was a teenager at the time. And you know, the nurse took my name. She's like, oh, James Hewitt. She's like, have you seen much of Princess Diana recently? And uh, you know, I just thought this is not the time. You know, give me some morphine and leave me in peace. But um, but yeah, really appreciate you bringing that one up, Greg. That's, uh, that's great. <laughs> Sorry, I, I know how lame comments about names can be. You're speaking to someone with the surname Potter, so I've had a life of, <laughs> oh, is your middle name Harry? But, yeah, exactly. Are you related? Yeah, I I can fully relate. And I was actually going to ask you about whether you've experienced a spike in search engine results for James Hewitt off the back of Prince Harry's worldwide privacy tour, but we will get to knowledge work now. And yeah, sounds good. on that subject, I was just wondering about whether you could give up to perhaps five recommendations that you consistently find yourself giving to individuals who want to perform better in the workplace. I mean, to give some context, most of the people that I work with are knowledge workers and, you know, famous guy called Peter Drucker one of the most widely known influential things on management uh, is defined, uh, uh, is credited with defining that, uh, that term. And he said that knowledge workers generate value primarily through cognitive rather than physical work, and that the flow of information is the primary enabler of their occupation. And that brings a lot of benefits because people get a lot of autonomy over how they work, but also a lot of downsides. And one of those is that work often ends up being boundaryless. There's very dis little distinction between work and non-work time. People don't have regular office hours. Um, and the fact that that role is information-based means that you can do pretty much everything you need to with a phone or laptop. So a lot of the recommendations I end up giving end up being in the context of knowledge work being boundaryless and this these lack of boundaries between work and home life. Um, and so a lot of the recommendations are around being more intentional about how we distribute effort and recovery, both at the micro level and the macro level. So I often end up talking about micro breaks quite a lot during the day. You know, so rather than having back to back meetings, having a 10 minute break in between and we can dig into why that's helpful maybe later. Another thing I often talk about is creating environments of focus so that when you're in an on period, uh, when you're in a block of focus work, you're not being continually interrupted by um, notifications and distractions, which are ramping up your cognitive load and decreasing your productivity. I often talk about trying to reduce some of the cognitive depth as I describe it. Uh, and by that, I mean getting rid of some of the meetings 
because there are so many meetings which are completely unnecessary and probably could be replaced with a single well-worded email. And actually helping people to make work more sustainable, it not leaking into every moment of their life, is getting rid of some of the meetings in the day so they can get some work done instead of having to wait to finish it at home. So that's, a, that's another top tip. And then thinking about outside of work. And so unsurprisingly, it's about adequate sleep, at least seven hours of quality sleep. And again, I'm sure that we can we can get into those details as well. And then the final thing I often end up talking about is just not just thinking about exercise, but thinking about generally about physical activity. Because one of the challenges with knowledge work, being cognitive work in our head, is the fact that we can sometimes get separated from our physical selves. And unfortunately, it seems that all this sedentary time in front of the computer is an independent risk factor. And so if we, even if we exercise once a day, if we're sitting on our backsides for the rest of the day, that's associated with all kinds of negative outcomes. So thinking about how you can integrate more movement into the day, and sometimes you know, 10,000 steps uh, is a good target, a helpful target for some people. So yeah, so they'd be my, my five tips, probably went over two minutes, um, and there's others, but they're probably the main topics that come up again and again in the context of knowledge work. Spoken like an exercise scientist at heart. If there are differences between the determinants of performance for individuals and teams, what do you say to people who are trying to flourish in a team environment? So, I mean, I think some of this is about thinking about culture, um, because I think one of the challenges with workplace well-being often um, is that we can end up talking too much about individual interventions without thinking about fostering healthy cultures. And in essence, when I'm talking about workplace culture, I'm thinking about the DNA of an organization. It's sometimes described as the way things are done around here. So if people need to perform well, they want to be well in a team context, I'm often thinking about three things. I'm thinking about how can you foster positive relationships? Because we know that a supportive workplace culture encourages positive relationships, that trust, that empathy, that open communication is gonna be absolutely critical. It's no good telling people to sleep well at night and get seven hours if they're lying in bed stressing out because they're really struggling to uh, work with the people who are in their office every day, for example. Um, it is about a culture that encourages healthy behaviours. It's where those behaviours are modelled. If we're a leader, that we're modelling those behaviours for our teams, for example, um, but also creating environments where there's access to those healthy behaviours, where we remove those barriers, you know, whether it's about access to natural space, whether it's about um, default blocking of meetings to be 25 minutes rather than 30 minutes and 50 rather than 60 so that people can take those micro breaks. And finally, I think it's about providing psychological safety or facilitating psychological safety. Because again, it's not just about individual level interventions. We want to create cultures where people feel safe to express their thoughts, to take risks. That risk might be, I'm going to take the afternoon off because I'm tired and I know that I'm going to be more productive tomorrow as a result of this. And that the increase in productivity after taking the risk to switch off today it's probably going to more than compensate for this time off. So make it, creating environments, fostering environments where people feel safe enough to look after themselves, where that there's a recognition of that link between well-being and performance, which is going to boost mental health, engagement, creativity, job satisfaction, and hopefully create those virtuous cycles. So yeah, when I'm thinking about team environment and well-being, I think you know, culture, um, the way things are done around here, and trying to shift that in a more positive direction that's orientated towards well-being and performance is really critical. We'll come back to safety later, but I saw you post something interesting about how feelings of psychological safety interact with workplace conflict. And when I say conflict, I don't mean conflict in a negative way, rather that people have differing ideas about things. And when people feel psychologically safe, that type of conflict can actually enhance team performance. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is going to become even more important. You know, there's, there's an argument that creativity is the new productivity. And it's kind of like a nice thing to say, isn't it? But, but I think that the, the truth behind that statement is the fact that it seems likely that some of these generative AI tools are going to really accelerate productivity in many ways. They can, with the appropriate prompt instructions, they can do an awful lot of stuff for us. So what becomes more important are, is the quality of our interpersonal relationships, is the creative ideation that emerges from that. It's maybe taking the output of the general purpose transformers, the GPTs, and thinking about how you implement that in organizations, which is gonna require a partnership with the machines, but also with each other. And 
those partnerships, those collaborative discussions, the creativity, the novel ideas, they're only going to emerge in environments where people are safe enough to share those ideas, but also in environments where people feel um, safe enough to fail. Because rapid learning is often characterized by quick failure. And I think you can take this idea of, you know, fail fast, fail, fail forward, like way too far. And unfortunately, some of that I think was supercharged by you know, the, the cheap money environment that we've enjoyed for so many years, where you could get huge amounts of investment into a startup with no route to revenue. And uh, there wasn't a lot of accountability. So uh, you could fail quickly, often. Um, and so I think I don't want to take that to an extreme and for it to be misunderstood. But failure is a reality of any effective research and development process. One of the great examples of that is in Formula One. Um, where the research and development processes and, and performance is often characterized by the team which can go through the most rapid and the most frequent cycles of development and redevelopment um, in between seasons, in between races. And that results in an awful lot of failure, um, but you get success providing you learn from that. So that link between conflict, between safety, between performance for me is characterized by people being able to share ideas, to try ideas, to fail sometimes, to be able to own it and learn from it, which is only possible in a psychologically safe environment so that you can accelerate that rate of learning and achieve true performance, which I think is really going to revolve around collaboration, creativity, complex problem solving, probably in a partnership between people and these AI tools, whatever they look like in the context that people are working in. And we'll come back to some of those AI tools later, but suffice it to say the old Silicon Valley aphorism of move fast and break things has its limitations. And it's interesting the way that different company cultures can be successful in different contexts. But mm. moving on from that, my final question, and I'm going to ask for another short answer to it, is we last spoke five years ago when I interviewed you for the Human OS radio podcast, which might well be my favorite health related podcast. So props to Dan Pardy, who's the CEO there, DJ Dan Pardy, and people <laughs> should definitely tune into that. And as an aside, I always link to resources that are mentioned on the show in the show notes, and I'll link to Human OS radio. But since that time, you have very nearly finished your PhD. And I was wondering about whether your PhD is fundamentally changed how you think about the determinants of performance at work at all? Um, it certainly has in several ways. I think one of the ways that it's changed it is by providing a more structured conceptual framework to fit together not only my observations of the challenges in knowledge work specifically, but also how to contextualize some of the interventions and approaches and link those together. Specifically, two models have been very, very helpful um, in that, um, which I've lent on extensively in my PhD research, um, both uh, in terms of you know the, reviewing the literature, but also providing a basis for the studies um, that form the backbone of the, of the thesis. Um, and those two models are the effort recovery model and the conservation of resources theory. And uh, I can provide links that you can share so people can read it and dig into that. But essentially, the effort recovery model describes that we need this balance between the effort that we make and adequate recovery um, to be able to support well-being and performance. And actually um, uh, demands that effort needs to be removed for recovery to take place. But the conservation of resources theory complements that because it says that recovery isn't just this passive process of removing effort or removing demands, but actually that removal, that those demands and the depleting of resources represents a threat. And so that motivates us to try to gather more resources and, and establish these gain spirals, which help us to restore and recover our resources. And it also has got this really nice theory of resource caravans associated with it. This idea that um, where, we, where we gain resources in one area, maybe energetic resources, for example, that can help us to restore and gain resources in other areas. Maybe, for example, self-efficacy, so self-confidence. And that can help us to achieve our goals, for example, which might lead to more resources. So you could see, for example, in the context of the workplace, in terms of how I'd link this together, is that you've got a situation whereby someone's resources are depleted because they've had a long work day. Then they try and get adequate sleep to restore those resources. And if they do, 
that's going to help them to improve their cognitive resources the next day, their cognitive performance, which helps them achieve their work goals, which actually then helps them to have more self-confidence that they're doing a good job, which means they're probably more likely to be able to switch off at the end of the day, experience that sense of mental distance, which will then improve their sleep the next night. And you've got this virtuous cycle, this gain spiral of resource gain. Unfortunately, the opposite is also true. And so that conceptualization of the need for passive recovery, just the removal of demand sometimes, the switching off, but also the way that we can establish these resource gain spirals has been really helpful to start to link together the data I've captured, the hypothesis I've tested, and also operationalize that in my work. So looking, for example, in organizations and teams for ways that you can establish gain spirals and link these different factors together, but also the trigger points that you can intervene in to break the loss spirals that may be trapping people uh, in these downward loops of, of resource loss. And, uh, and so that's been very helpful. And one of the examples of how my PhD has, has shifted some of my approach, or maybe my approach has matured as a response to uh, the things that I've learned and explored in that doctoral research process. I'm sure some of that resonates with people in the context of a slumping economy and cost of living crisis. But mm. moving on to some slightly more specific questions, keen to discuss work structure and cognition. And we can think of cognition as the mental processes that are needed to acquire knowledge and understanding and in turn achieve goals. If we think about this chronologically, beginning with the start of the day, what are some of the things that you would recommend to tee up a successful working day? And I was thinking maybe you could touch on the importance of clarifying priorities as well as the so-called prime method. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, I think that, um, again, I'm really a sports scientist, like that you are in many ways, Greg, and my PhD has ended up in organizational psychology, but you know, I, I still look at the world often through the lens of someone who's a sports scientist looking at endurance sport and, how do you support sustained effort? And so if you think about in a sporting context um, with an athlete, if they're about to do a really sustained effort, um, you don't expect them to just turn up and be able to perform straight away. So we'll take kind of a time trial, for example, you know, uh, um, or maybe a, a, a road race in, in cycling. Well, people do a warm up for a start. You know, there's actually this process of, uh, of increasing the activity of the systems in the body to prepare it for this big effort. But even before then, there's going to be some kind of briefing. You, know, you sit down often in the team bus you know, with the director and your teammates, and you'll talk about you know, what are you trying to achieve in the day. You'll have that role very, very clear. And interestingly, you know, we talk about sleep, we talk about stress, we talk about these hacks, and you know, we can talk about the importance of bright light in the morning and caffeine, and whatever, and all that stuff. But one of the most important things that we can do to support well-being and performance in the workplace is to have role clarity. And actually, the evidence is quite clear that um, lack of role clarity, lack of job clarity, not really having a clear idea what you're supposed to be doing is an incredible source of stress. And some of the responsibility for tackling this is on, I think, the employer and the manager and the leader. But actually, we can also play our part in that. And part of it is in this process that we go through at the start of the day. And so in a similar way that you might sit down with your director um, in a cycling race and figure out what you're supposed to do that day. I encourage people to check in with themselves in the morning before they start and remind themselves what they're there to do. But perhaps most importantly, also remind themselves what they're there not to do. And the prime method is basically a heuristic tool. Start to think about that. And it's a kind of clunky way to think about three elements. Um, you know, what is your priority? What's the main thing that you need to do? What's the, um, the kind of the number one thing that if you complete it for that day, you call the day a success. You might even look at it a slightly more narrow way and just look at it in the morning, for example, and then tackle something else in the afternoon. But what is your priority? You know, for a cyclist, it might be be at the front at this time in this place so that you can support your teammate. For a knowledge worker, it might be the kind of the, the, the major task which you need to take a chunk out of that day to make some progress on. So what is your priority? The second thing, part of that prime method, the M, is about mindset because sometimes unfortunately that priority item is also the thing that we're most worried about and that's one of the reasons why often we'll procrastinate we won't do it because there's a sometimes a fear of failure and we've all been there you've got that big task you're worried that maybe 
it's complicated. You'll have that horrible moment where you sit at the computer and you don't really know how to tackle it. And you might do it and the output might not be as good as you expect it is, or someone else might think that it's not as good as you do. And so a simple way to do this is to prime yourself with a mindset that's oriented, orientated around curiosity and learning. So you say, okay, you know, regardless of the outcome of this, I'm gonna try and learn something through it. I'm gonna pay attention to my process. I'm gonna do as well as I can and, and see what happens. But I know that even if it's not quite as good as I expect, I'm gonna make some progress and I'm gonna learn something from it. You know, some people talk about this as a growth mindset, you know, that actually how you perform in that moment, uh, in that block of work, it isn't a reflection necessarily of your fixed abilities. It's actually an opportunity to grow and improve and develop uh, over time. So there's the priority, there's the mindset. And the final thing is the elimination. And that refers to what I mentioned earlier, which is don't just ask yourself what your priority is, what you, you need to do, what you're there for. Also ask yourself, what are you not going to do? What can you eliminate? That's the E. And you know, that could be on a very micro level, like I'm going to eliminate distractions and interruptions by switching off my notifications during this block of work, uh, you know, for the first couple of hours of the day. You know, we're bombarded with notifications continually, most of us. And so a simple elimination is I'm not going to respond to emails during this time. I'm just going to focus on this thing, even if it's difficult, because there's often this distraction, this desire to go and distract ourselves because we want a little bit of dopamine to make ourselves feel good because the priority task is a bit challenging. So there's that elimination, but also um, in terms of setting expectations with teammates as well to say this morning for this period, I'm working on my highest priority task. And so don't schedule meetings. And that could be a rhythm that you actually set up from week to week that you might be able to have protected times during your week. So I'd encourage people to try and set their day up with that level of intention, priority, mindset, elimination. But also, is there a way that you can integrate some kind of cognitive warm up into the start of your day? like a cyclist who's getting ready for a race or a time trial uh, to get the motor working. And for me, the simplest way to do that is to try and end the previous day uh, or the previous time that I worked on that priority task um, uh, by setting up, setting an intention for the next thing that I'm going to do. Um, so I actually leave a kind of open thread. If I'm writing something, for example, I'll just put a couple of bullets to remind myself what I'm going to write next, or I'll deliberately leave a paragraph half written uh, with bullets to complete it. And the reason that's helpful is because then when you get into that priority task, um, you don't have, it, it helps you to warm up, it helps you to get going. It's not a cold start, you know, where you're staring at the blank page or you don't really have a clear sense of what you're actually going to work on. And so you do something to have that kind of cognitive warm up that will get you in the flow um, so that you can get up to speed on the highest priority task. And so if, if you're able to do that, and for, often, for many people, it often is in the morning, but you could maybe shift that same process to later in the day um, if you're more of a kind of late chronotype, but use that prime method, priority mindset elimination um, uh, to, to try to maximize the, the output during that time. And you probably find that it will reduce your stress uh, during that time as well. Does that answer your question, Greg? Is that, is that helpful? Very much so. And it's interesting hearing you say that. It makes me think of bookends and mm. how the bookends of the day have to relate to each other which brings to mind things that I've heard from people such as Cal Newport about having a, a shutdown routine at the end of the day. But then you're speaking specifically about how that then influences the next day. Regarding elimination, one of the posts that you made on LinkedIn that I appreciated was the idea of having a do not do list as opposed to just a to do list, which is a, a really nice way to flip that on its head and I think is increasingly important in a modern knowledge work context. But the point that I wanted to briefly zoom in on is related to mindset. And we know that mindset is a remarkably powerful determinant of health and performance in many contexts. And as an example of this, there's been quite a lot of research on how whether people perceive stress as either being enhancing in some way or degrading in some way influences their subsequent response to that stress such that people who perceive it as being enhancing experience better mood and cognitive performance in demanding tasks related to that i was just wondering about whether you have any specific strategies with respect to manipulating mindset acutely to help people perform better at work that might relate to how they frame tasks. I know that there are things like apps out there too that 
are acute mindset interventions that have been studied in research contexts. But does anything come to mind, James? Yeah, so I think my go-to intervention um, is generally related to self-talk because, you know, there's really interesting evidence from um, a sporting context, again, about the efficacy of self-talk um, for improving performance. And so, you know, there's a classic example, again, from a time trial where they demonstrated that um, by prompting people to use positive self-talk when they started to experience the discomfort associated with effort, improved time trial performance in a 10 kilometer time trial by between 13 and 71 seconds. And so that um, the type of phrases people used were things like, I can manage my energy until the end uh, in response to these discom this uncomfortable sensation that made them feel like they were running out of energy. And um, to put that in context, uh, you know, there's a great time trialist, Fabian Cancellara, who's retired now. Um, but um, in when he did a prologue in the Tour de France, I think it was, which was similar to 10, 10 kilometers and he won it. And um, you know, if he had, if he'd finished 71 seconds slower, so at the bottom end of that, um, he wouldn't have finished first. He would have been like 133rd. Um, even if he'd been, you know, seven seconds lower, he would have been in third place in the podium or something like that. Um, but there's some interesting evidence in a knowledge work context as well about the efficacy of our perspective and, and even potentially how we can use self-talk. And some of that experimentally comes from when people um, do things like uh, public speaking tasks. Uh, researchers love using public speaking because it's a way that you can induce stress, but also you can measure performance uh, in quite helpful ways because you can get people to self-rate their performance, but also you can get an audience to rate different um, aspects of that performance, so how convincing they were, how fluent they were, for example. And there was a quite an interesting study that was done where um, they trained people to, as you mentioned, perceive stress as, as performance enhancing. And the way they did that was when people got nervous, rather than telling people to calm down, um, they encouraged them to perceive that sense of nervousness as excitement, for example. And when people reframed that experience of nervousness as excitement and energizing, subsequently their performance was related, uh, was uh, rated as being significantly higher. They performed better in terms of how convincing they were and on several different dimensions. And so my, one of my go-to interventions really is about using self-talk to reframe um, and to do that briefly. And some of it is about the script that you have in your head. So if someone is struggling with anxiety, for example, with stress about the load that they have to, to work through, sometimes I'll ask them, have you experienced situations before where you've managed to get through similar workloads? And usually the answer is yes. And so you, then I, I'll encourage them to reflect on that and say, so you know you have got what it takes, you can do this. And sometimes it's these subtle shifts in self-talk where we feel overwhelmed and we can prompt ourselves and remind ourselves that it's gonna be okay, uh, that we've got enough energy to manage it to the end, that there's gonna be a time for recovery and uh, remind ourselves and actually schedule that recovery in um, so you can start to improve people's endurance um, uh, in that way. That said, what I don't want to be misunderstood from this is that, again, the responsibility for management of this high stress is all on the employee. And actually, if you've got a leader or you're in an organisation that is making unrealistic demands of you, you can do all the self-talk that you like and it's not going to help. Um, but the reality is, is even in a perfect organisation, there's times of overload. And if you want to really achieve things, sometimes you've got to push yourself. Um, and, uh, and so some of these tactics and strategies can be helpful in that kind of context where you are trying to push the limits of how long you can sustain effort for um, in a healthier way. And actually, the evidence does indicate that if we reframe stress as positive um, within reason, then you actually see reductions in some of the harmful outcomes associated with that stress response. Uh, you can measure that in terms of you know, cortisol uh, reactivity, for example, for example. Um, you know, the, the kind of the dump of stress hormones that you get and how quickly they are, they are subsequently cleared. Building on talk of excitement and stress, that brings us to psychophysiological arousal. Mm. And we know that that is related to performance in various different types of tasks, as famously plotted by the Yerkes Dodson law graph, which I'm sure you're intimately familiar with, James. For listeners, in this graph, the y-axis is performance, the vertical axis that is, and the x-axis, the horizontal axis is arousal. So how alert you feel simplistically. And it plots 
an inverted U shape such that the sweet spot for performance is moderate levels of arousal. You neither want to be under aroused or over aroused, although there are actually two different versions of the plots that have been put forward. So in the original version, there was a different relationship for relatively simple tasks such that performance actually plateaued at the right hand side of the graph, meaning that if someone's doing something that's relatively straightforward, they can do that well with very high levels of arousal. Whereas if the task is more complex, that inverted U shape remains. So I actually have two questions related to this. One of them is what do you think about the validity of that so-called law? And then secondarily, if somebody is under aroused, and obviously I'm not speaking about sexual arousal, to be clear, I'm speaking about cognitive arousal. Do you have any recommendations regarding what people can do in the short term to boost their arousal? And I'm thinking of things such as physical activity, light exposure, changes in breathing patterns, perhaps even listening to music too. Um, really interesting topic, isn't it? I mean, I think I'm fascinated by those curves you know, that describe the relationship between alertness or arousal and performance and how they manifest differently um, for different people and also in different contexts. And again, you know, both in, in sporting contexts and business contexts. I mean, one of the characteristics, so I think in general, both of those curves do hold true. I think they, uh, they're pretty robust in terms of what we observe in different settings in terms of human performance. Um, but one of the things I've observed that's quite interesting is um, where you look at very high performers in a domain relative to kind of the average or low. And what I generally see is that with very high performers, their performance is more characterized by that J-shaped curve um, rather than the inverted U. And the way that expresses itself um, uh, is that you know, for someone who's an average performer, what you often see is that as that kind of arousal or stress or whatever you wanted to call it starts to increase um, on that, uh, that horizontal x-axis, um, that you do reach this, this optimum point um, where you can be under aroused, there's a sweet spot, and then it kind of gradually drops off. But what I see, and this is anecdotal, but what I see with high performers often is that they're able to tolerate a huge amount of stress and arousal and still perform at a very high level, likely because you know, so much of what they do is quite automaticized. You know, they're very highly trained. Their, their skills are very well embedded. You know, again, if it's in a sporting or in a business context, but there is a point where they can't tolerate any more. And what you actually see is a catastrophic, catastrophic drop off in performance rather than this that gradual decline. And I think you know, that sometimes you, you might describe that acutely you know, where it might just be kind of uh, in you know, that we all have heard this, the stories of the high performer in a business context where everything seems fine. And then one day in the meeting, somebody says something and they just explode and, you know, all of the professionalism drops away or they might not explode in anger. They might just break down and, and cry. Um, and no one knew that it was coming. Everyone's shocked. And it's sometimes the highest performers. And this is one of the reasons is, is that these people are incredibly skilled. They've got a huge capacity, but the underlying message is everyone's got a limit. You know, there's a limit uh, beyond which like we can't be pushed and we can't tolerate that anymore. So, so yeah, so I definitely see that both of those curves are expressed in reality in different people at different times. Um, but to that question of what do you do if you're under aroused? I think it's a really good one because we can talk about stress or activation when we talk about that horizontal kind of arousal axis. And, Often when we talk about workplace wellbeing performance, we tend to think about um, what's going on at that kind of top end of the range where people are overstimulated, where there's too much stress, where we start to see kind of um, negative manifestations of stress, such as burnout, for example, or anxiety. We less often talk about what goes on at the front part of that curve, uh, where people might not be activated enough. Uh, this is quite interesting. You know, one of the conversations I've had with a leading researcher uh, into this idea of work-related rumination, our inability to switch off from work, you know, the importance of psychological detachment. One of the things we've sometimes pondered on um, is this idea that the people who are really good at psychologically detaching from work and getting that sense of mental distance, um, we wonder, did they ever switch on in the first place? Uh, you know, and actually, are they just really far down that arousal curve? Kind of, uh, you know, they're just underactivated, and that's why they find it so easy to switch off because they never really switched on into that optimal zone. And so I think there is a reality that some people 
do need to do that. And sometimes we need to do that. Even as people who are really high performers, we've all experienced those times where we're not quite awake enough. And I think there are a number of practical things that we can do. And you, you touched on a few of them uh, in your introduction. But one of the ones that I'm becoming increasingly interested in is light. And I'd be really interested to hear your view on this, Greg, because I know that you know, you're, you've got much deeper expertise, uh, particularly around you know, chronotype and circadian rhythm than I have. Um, but one of the things that I've become increasingly aware of is how dull many working environments are and the effect that that has on our alertness. And, you know, as you'll know, there's research that indicates there's a dose response relationship between light intensity and alertness, how awake we are. And you know, typical indoor lighting is uh, about 90 to 180 lux, um, lux being a measure of kind of light, of brightness, essentially. And that light intensity only generates, according to some research that I've read, 50% of the alerting effect of bright light, which would be around 9,000 lux, which you might get outside, for example, even on a day that wasn't particularly bright, even on a cloudy day, potentially. And so a really simple way that I encourage people to shift themselves up that arousal curve and get into more of a sweet spot is to make sure that they're getting out and getting enough bright light. And so you know, when we experience these dips in alertness later in the day, often, and it can sometimes be because we've just been in such a dull environment all day and we just need to get outside. Um, or if we can't um, really think about the lighting in an office environment. And actually, you know, that's something that I've, uh, I've spoken to several companies about uh, when they've gone through um, processes of uh, refurbishing their offices or moving to new offices or even building offices, for example, you're know, thinking about lighting. So lighting is a big one. And um, physical activity, as you said, is fantastic. You know, it's, it's really interesting. Um, ice baths are so popular now, aren't they? everybody's talking about ice baths and um, <laughs> there's uh, someone in particular talks about them an awful lot um, and um, and I heard this great stat that uh, this uh, this person shared and he said oh uh, if you take an ice bath it increases your dopamine by 500 percent and I looked at the study that kind of um, uh, uh, did that that kind of resulted in that finding and there is a study it was done in a group of young men and so great you know it increases dopamine increases alertness I can get on board with that even though it's an indirect measure but then this person went on to say, an ice bath will increase your dopamine substantially more than any other intervention. And I thought, now that is interesting because I've never read anything that has directly compared the effects of ice baths on alertness and dopamine compared with other interventions. And so I asked the question, I'd love to read this study. Please, can you share the link? Because I've never seen anything comparing the alerting or dopamine enhancing effects of ice baths compared with other interventions. I didn't get a response. Maybe you are familiar with a paper that, that shows that. But the reason that I was asking that question is I'm not convinced that ice baths are necessarily more alerting or more dopamine inducing um, than other things like physical activity, for example. It's fundamentally, I think all these things, as you've mentioned, you know, psychophysiologically are upregulating us. And what we're trying to do is reach the state of optimal activation. I would describe it as you know, where we've got that 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 sweet spot between not too much stress, um, but not too little either. And we know that one of the most reliable ways to upregulate our physiology and our mind, psychophysiologically, uh, physiological upregulation, to get this dump of dopamine, which can make us kind of uh, motivate ourselves towards uh, reward seeking and, uh, and goal directed behavior, um, which is you know, what's going on kind of under the hood neurophysiologically uh, associated with that dump uh, of dopamine. We know that exercise, physical activity, is one of the most reliable ways to do that. And you don't have to get wet generally. You could just get up from your desk and go for a brisk walk or, you know, maybe go to the gym and, yeah, you have to have a shower at the end. But if you've got the time, we know that substantially increases alertness, arousal. It also will be associated likely with improvements in cognitive performance too, uh, with reductions in stress. We know that exercise also seems to bias the amygdala, uh, you know, the stress and fear center of the brain, as it's sometimes called towards feelings of happiness and away from fear. We see these neurophysiological changes. So, um, so yeah, so my inclination is generally to go for things like bright light, um, for things like exercise, but also caffeine in the right place at the right time. Um, you know, this links in with the morning thing. And I'm interested if you've got a view on this actually. I mean, caffeine is a really effective smart drug. There was quite an interesting study that compared the effects of caffeine relative to modafinil, um, sometimes called ProVigil, um, which is used to con uh, counter narcolepsy um, clinically, but it's often used off label and illicitly as a smart drug. And they found that caffeine was as effective 
as modafinil. So caffeine is an amazing compound. Uh, it's an amazing molecule, um, rather. And so, um, yeah, I think right use of caffeine, um, which in my view, based on the evidence, is about little and often and stop at midday, essentially. About 0.3 milligrams per kilogram of body mass seems to be sufficient to, for an optimal alerting dose. But one of the things I've heard, and this is what I'd like your view on, is loads of people now talking about the fact that you really need to avoid caffeine within the first hour of waking up. And uh, uh, because it's related to you know, your natural cortisol spike, and you don't want to interrupt with that, interrupt that, and you don't want to kind of block off your adenosine receptors you know, before um, uh, and by taking this uh, exogenous substance. And again, like there's a kind of mechanism there that sounds plausible, but I've not seen any evidence to indicate where anyone's explored the question of whether caffeine timing, i.e. avoiding it within the first 90 minutes of waking up, which I think is being what's recommended, is associated with subsequent improvements in alertness or performance or any benefits later in the day. So interested in your reflection on the early part. And also I've got that specific question for you. Not conventional, maybe, for the guests to be asking you, asking the podcast those questions, but <laughs> I'd love to know what you think because people are talking about this all the time and recommending it on LinkedIn every other day. So be interested to hear your view on that. You're a man after my heart, James. I love it. Anything that reinforces my worldview and doesn't challenge me. There are several things that you mentioned there that I'll pick up on. The first of them was light exposure. And I think there are a few important points to make. One of them is that, as you say, there can be dramatic differences in the intensity of light indoors versus outdoors that far exceed what people would expect. Because while your brain does register these differences in intensity, you wouldn't necessarily perceive those consciously. If you go from a room that's brightly lit, that is say 1000 lux to being outdoors on a sunny day at midday, which could be as high as roughly 150,000 lux. So 150 fold difference. You wouldn't feel like it was 150 times brighter, but your brain and body do register that. Another thing related to light exposure to note is that it's not only brightness that matters, but also timing and the composition of light in particular. And people will have heard about blue light specifically, and that's often in the context of people saying avoid blue light at night. A couple of comments on that. One is that any full spectrum light contains short wavelength light. So if you're looking at white light, then that will have quite similar effects to blue light. And I just think a lot of people won't realize that. Another is that if you spend lots of time exposed to high intensity, short wavelength, rich light during the day, say, for example, by spending at least one hour outdoors in daylight each day, that will strongly buffer against any modest effects of light at night. And a lot of the research that's looked at the effects of, for example, using tablets before bed on subsequent sleep has kept people in more or less darkness in the hours preceding the exposure to the tablet, which magnifies the effect of that small amount of light at night. And subsequent more ecologically valid research has shown that tablet use basically doesn't do anything to the timing of the body clock or sleep architecture, provided that somebody has at least some light exposure during the daytime, even if they're just indoors during the daytime. Related to the composition of light and those wavelengths, there is now a standardized way of looking at the effects of light on the cells in the eye that mediate many of the non-visual effects of light. It's called the melanopic equivalent daytime illuminance. And if people are interested in this, then I'd point them to a consensus paper that was published in PLOS Biology last year. Tim Brown is the lead author on it, and it convened a group of experts, in particular in circadian biology, and they put forward some consensus recommendations regarding indoor lighting to optimize health and performance. So, for example, they give recommendations for indoor daytime light, for light in the three hours before bedtime, and for light in the sleep environment too. Regarding dopamine and cold exposure, I have lots of thoughts on that, which I think largely align with yours. 
some of what you're discussing reflects common misconceptions. And one of those is that what you find in the blood corresponds to what's going on in the brain. So in the study that you're referring to, they looked at blood levels of certain monoamines. So they looked at noradrenaline and dopamine in the blood, and they did find that levels of those substantially rose following cold exposure, but then extrapolating that that reflects what's going on in the brain and that those acute changes in brain monoamine signaling predict improved performance is enormously short-sighted. And if you actually look at the research on cold exposure and acute changes in cognition, cognition gets worse during cold exposure. There are things that you can do to somewhat offset the effects of cold exposure on cognition. For example, there's some really interesting work on using L-tyrosine supplementation prior to cold exposure. And L-tyrosine is a precursor that supports the synthesis of noradrenaline and dopamine. And because those get turned over faster during stresses such as cold exposure, you can better maintain cognition during cold exposure if somebody takes, say, one to two grams of L-tyrosine first. Some of the studies use much higher doses than that, but frankly, those aren't needed because the rate-limiting enzyme in that pathway, which is tyrosine hydroxylase, probably gets saturated around one to two grams of L-tyrosine. And regarding comparisons between the effects of different stimuli on dopaminergic neurotransmission, there is some of that type of research in non-human animals, but assuming that what you find happens in C57, black six male mice corresponds to what goes on in adult humans is probably a little bit misguided. And also this isn't just about dopamine and noradrenaline. I think some of this emanates from the way that people speak about dopamine colloquially in conversations of things like social media. Oh, you use Instagram, you get a dopamine hit every time you get a like or some nonsense like that. And obviously the brain is an awful lot more complex than that. Then finally, regarding caffeine, it's a really interesting subject and shameless plug, I'll point people to an article that I wrote for Resilient Nutrition, which is a company that I co-founded in 2020. I'm no longer really involved with Resilient Nutrition, but I think it's a nice primer on how caffeine affects the brain and the body, particularly in the context of insufficient sleep, which frankly, I think is when caffeine really comes into its own. There are a few things to mention. First, you spoke about dose. The optimal dose of caffeine depends on what you're trying to improve, of course. So if you're trying to improve sports performance, you would probably need doses of three to six milligrams per kilogram before exercise lasting up to about five hours. And you probably take that dose 45 minutes to an hour before the exercise bout. Whereas with cognition, lower doses are probably preferable. And there's been some really interesting work looking at repeated use of low dose caffeine in the context of extended wakefulness by people such as David Dingy's, showing that that regular dose of roughly 0.3 milligrams per kilo every hour or two is very good at supporting cognition in that type of context. And also interestingly, reducing sleep inertia that people experience off the back of short naps. So if you think about say a military context or somebody working an extended night shift, that type of strategy really comes into its own. And as a tangent, you can take different forms of caffeine. There are slow release forms and there are also forms that deliver caffeine by way of chewing gum. And when you consume caffeine via gum, it enters your system faster because it's actually taken up in the mouth. And then finally, you asked about avoiding caffeine in the first hour of the day. I think some of that came from some work that was published by scientists at the University of Bath. And they looked at what happened when they disrupted people's sleep by waking them up intermittently during the sleep period, and then looking at their oral glucose tolerance the morning after, following giving them caffeine, finding that when they had the caffeine before consuming food in the morning, their glucose tolerance was marginally worse. But 
I don't think that's very relevant to most people most of the time. And I think this stuff is massively overstated. And personally, as someone who's been very interested in caffeine and sleep and circadian biology for a long time, I just don't think that people should worry about any of this stuff. All of these types of discussions are very much majoring in the minors. So if you like mm -hmm. having a cup of coffee in the morning, shortly after waking up and before you have your breakfast, have that coffee and enjoy it and get on with your day and stop worrying about this stuff. Yeah, exactly. Now that's fantastic, Greg. And, you know, I really appreciate the time you've taken to, to share your knowledge in the area. I was really curious to hear your perspective. And as you say, it's wonderful that my confirmation bias was uh, supported by, by everything you had to say. But, um, but yeah, it, and it's kind of interesting as well. I think, you know, there's, uh, it's a bit of a tangent, but um, you know, both of us are involved to some extent um, uh, in this realm of what you might describe as science communication. And I think there's a huge responsibility to try to communicate science in a way that is accessible, um, but still remains true to our level of understanding um, in, a, in an area. And I think the challenge is, is that it doesn't lend itself to, um, to social media a lot of the time, where, where actually people want definitive answers, they want headlines, they don't want someone to say it depends. Um, and, and I think, you know, there's a, and I understand that. Um, and also I think there's this belief sometimes that you know, science does have these very definitive answers. And so when someone says, these are the five things I want you to do, you should do in the morning to kind of optimize your day. And, uh, and they want someone to say, don't have caffeine after 90 minutes, go in a cold plunge for this much time and it'll increase your dopamine by that much. And unfortunately, it's not, we don't necessarily have the level of knowledge to be able to provide those very, very specific ideas. In some areas, I think we do. But, um, but for me, you know, it is a challenge to kind of uh, translate science into practice in a way that is useful, um, but still reflects the fact that science is an ongoing process. It's a conversation of growing knowledge over time. And uh, even if that doesn't sometimes give people the answers that satisfy them as, as much as they would like, and also you know, the social media algorithms would, uh, would approve of and boost. Yeah, and we could have a very long conversation about that subject, but <laughs> maybe that is one time, for another maybe. time. People get too enamored by biological mechanisms and they start looking at specific pathways in the brain and the rest of the body and then how they can gain those pathways and make assumptions about how that's going to influence say daytime function and i just think that that is taking several leaps that people shouldn't take and to add one final comment, and this is just a bugbear, and I'm going to be doing subsequent podcasts about circadian biology and sleep. Another example of where I, I think people massively overemphasize the relative importance of a particular behavior is morning light exposure. Because while for some people, I do think that's a really important behavior and specifically for people who have very late sleep wake cycles and who thereby have to restrict their time in bed and then they suffer the deleterious effects of insufficient sleep. If you look at the other end of the chronotypic spectrum and by that, I mean people who are naturally very early birds. And this is exacerbated as people get older. There are people who are in their seventies and eighties who find themselves falling asleep at 7 p.m. and wide awake at 3 a.m. Telling them to get more morning light exposure is the precise opposite of what they need to be hearing. So we'll save that for another time, but just something for listeners to think about.